When you think of the Geelong Football Club today, it's a name synonymous with triumph and success. But it's easy to forget beneath the glitz and glamour of recent victories that the Cats endured a whopping 44 year premiership drought from 1963 to 2007. The 07 decider against the power goes down in history as the most one-sided grand final ever. Yet, amidst Geelong's modern glory, it's easy to overlook just how long they waited for that taste of victory. In this video, we're diving deep into the heart of Geelong's journey. The resilience, the defeats, and the ultimate triumph that transformed them into AFL champions. Not just a one-time win, we're talking about building a premiership dynasty. And hold on tight because we'll unravel the secrets behind their 15-year reign as perennial contenders. It's a tale of determination, success, and the enduring spirit of the Geelong Football Club. Now it's important to note that while the Cats may not have actually won flags throughout the 90s, we know they were consistently competitive. In fact, amazingly, in their 126 year history, the Cats have never finished a season in a spot on the ladder lower than 12th. They were a strong side in the early 90s, but ultimately came up short on a number of occasions deep into finals, before dipping out of the finals for five out of six years to linger between the 9th and 12th region of the ladder. The reason that this period of their history is important is because while they may not have had access to top draft talent, their success rate with recruiting is very striking. A lot goes into a 15 year period of sustained success, but their ability to draft what could only be described as clumps of champion footballers in the 1999 and 2001 drafts ultimately set up the Cats to be the juggernaut that they would become a half a decade later. In 1999, after an 11th place finish, the Cats would add four future Premiership players to their list. Joel Corey, Paul Chapman, Cameron Ling, and Corey Enright. Cameron Ling had the shortest career out of that lot with 246 games. As far as draft halls go, the Cats had absolutely pulled one out of the bag. But 2001 would probably trump that haul. Now there is an element of luck involved in having a father-son selection that year of one of the greatest footballers of all time. And it's safe to say the Cats absolutely struck gold with Gary Ablett Jr. turning out to be every bit as good as his father. But around that, the Cats also made some very shrewd drafting decisions. Jimmy Bartell would be drafted at pick eight, James Kelly at pick 17, and Steve Johnson at pick 24. In one fell swoop, the Cats had added two Brownlow medalists, two Norm Smith medalists, and four future Premiership players to their list. After a couple of outstanding drafts in a short period of time, it would naturally take a few years for that talent to develop, but not that long. In fact, in 2004, the Cats would shoot up from 12th on the ladder to make a prelim final against the Brisbane Lions. The following year, they'd be knocked out of one of the most dramatic semi-finals of all time by Nick Davis and the Sydney Swans. When the Cats bounced back out of the finals to finish 10th in 2006, I think it's fair to suggest that the AFL world had absolutely no inkling of the juggernaut that was about to emerge the following season. The Cats also continued their trend of striking gold in the rare event they had good draft picks, taking Joel Selwood at pick 7 of that draft. The 2007 season had an innocuous start for the Cats, with just two wins from their first five games. But in round six, they would put in a performance against the Richmond Football Club that seemed to completely alter the trajectory of their season. Having endured a week of intense scrutiny after a loss the previous week to the Kangaroos, the Cats would pile on a ridiculous 35 goals against the helpless Tiger side, and their final score would be 222. Now in retrospect, this result makes more sense given where the two sides finished on the ladder that season, but it's difficult to convey just how out of the blue this performance was. But it would set the tempo for the rest of the season. The Cats would play four finalists from the previous year through the next five weeks and beat them all convincingly. They would go on a 15 game winning streak which was only undone by a late Dom Cassisi winner at Skilled Stadium in round 21. The Cats finished on top with 152% and carried that form of destruction into the 2007 final series. They would easily dispose of the Brews in week 1 with a devastating 106 point victory before the Pies gave them a mighty scare in the prelim final, a game the Cats won by just 5 points. So that set up a grand final against Port Adelaide, and given the power had knocked off the Cats just a month prior at their home ground in Geelong, this result was far from a foregone conclusion. But the game certainly played out that way. The Cats led by four goals a quarter time before the game truly descended into being a bloodbath. The margin would be 90 points at three quarter time before Geelong kicked on to record the biggest grand final victory ever of 119 points. Jimmy Bartel had won the Brownlow medal, Steve Johnson would win the Norm Smith medal, and the Cats would win their 7th AFL Premiership 44 years after their 6th. But they weren't done with yet. 
Hey guys, just let you know that this video was proudly made in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a platform that connects you with credential therapists who are paid to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. Looking after your mental health is important. It's something I've talked about uh, heavily in the off season during the True Footy podcasts. You owe it to yourself to look after yourself and your mental health and therapy can obviously be a great way to do that. But the thing is, for some people, starting therapy can be quite difficult. Sometimes the right therapist for you is not in your area or you might find it difficult to engage in that face-to-face -face sort interaction. The great thing about BetterHelp is that you can arrange to have your therapy sessions either through a phone call, through a video chat, or even messaging. If you're interested in exploring this process, you can click the link in the description of this video. You'll then fill out a questionnaire to assess your specific needs, and in most cases, you'll be matched with a therapist within 48 hours. And the really convenient thing is, if you match with a therapist that you don't think is quite the right fit, you can change to another one at no additional cost. If you think you could benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. You can click on the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash truefooty. Clicking that link does support the channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist and see if it's the right fit for you. Thanks guys, let's get back to the video. The 2008 season for the Cats in my eyes has to be seen as the one that got away. It was their most dominant home and away season, losing just one game all year, albeit to the Magpies by 86 points. They would once again win the minor premiership and claim two relatively comfortable finals wins over the Saints and Bulldogs on their way to the 2008 grand final. The unfortunate thing for the Cats, however, was that on the horizon there was this pesky little team called the Hawthorne Football Club, who boasted names such as Lance Franklin, Sam Mitchell, Luke Hodge, and many more. The Hawks had a year out of the box, with Buddy Franklin incredibly kicking over 100 goals during the regular season. They had emerged to be the clear second best team in the competition that year, but many felt there was still a bit of a gap between them and the dominant Cats. But the Hawks saved their best performance of the season till last, stunning the Cats with a brilliant second half to claim their first flag in 17 years. And so, the brilliant Cats had been humbled and failed to claim the reward for their incredible 2008 season. 11 goals 23 in the decider ultimately cost them, and the Hawks looked destined to become a major flag contender for many years to come. Thankfully for Geelong, they would bottle this pain and use it to fuel them for a good few more seasons yet. The 2009 home and away season would be comparatively less dominant for the Cats, but they would still secure a top two finish with a record of 18 wins and four losses. They would have to overcome a new fearsome contender that year in St Kilda, however, who lost their first game of the season that year in round 20. The grand final that year between these two sides will be remembered as one of the better grand finals of that era. The Saints led narrowly at every change before the Cats found a gear in the final term to run out 12 point winners. Paul Chapman would be awarded the Norm Smith medal, while Gary Ablett Jr. claimed his first Brownlow medal that year. To play in three consecutive grand finals is an enormous effort, and to claim two of them is a fantastic result. But, once again, you'd be foolish to assume this would be the end of Geelong's reign at the top of the ladder. They would once again finish in the top two in 2010, as the AFL witnessed the rise of a Collingwood side that revolutionised the game with their forward press. These pies would prove too good for the Cats that year, denying them their fourth grand final appearance in a row with a 41 point win in the prelim final. If the result of that loss wasn't bitter enough, the 2010 off-season would prove to be a difficult one for the football club. On the 29th of September that year, after months of speculation, Gary Ablett Jr. would sign a five-year contract valued at $9 million with the league's new franchise, the Gold Coast Suns. As good as the Cats were as a team, plucking out one of their best ever players in Ablett was undoubtedly a devastating blow, and many consider this to be the beginning of the end for Geelong as an AFL powerhouse. Compounding that was coach Bomber Thompson deciding to step down as senior coach citing a need for a break. He would be replaced by former Brisbane Premiership player Chris Scott. It's quite an illogical thing, really, that you can take away a team's best player and replace their coach and for them to improve as a football team. But that's pretty much what happened with the Cats in 2011. They would finish second on the ladder behind Collingwood but still managed a 19-win season. They would dispense with the Hawks and the Eagles in their two finals first up before facing the Pies in the 2011 Grand Final. Given the Pies were the reigning premiers and had come off a 20-win, two-loss season themselves, Geelong went into this game as underdogs by the barest of margins. It would be a neck-and-neck -neck grand final for three quarters before the Cats would pull away to claim their third premiership win in five years. They had established themselves as one of the greatest teams of the modern era and demonstrated an incredible resilience when plenty had doubted them in the absence of Gary Ablett Jr. So that would be Geelong's last premiership win for a while, and it set up a very interesting decade for that football club. They would spend most of the decade as perennial contenders, good enough to be in the final mix every year but failed to overcome the final hurdle, despite getting close several times. 
In the three years following their 2011 Premiership, the Cats would be eliminated in each of the different stages of finals, before falling to miss the finals entirely in 2015. And as club legends such as Bartel, Johnson, Chapman, Enright and Kelly called time on their careers, much was said of Geelong's need to rebuild their list entirely. But at the end of 2015, Geelong would pull off one of their most influential free agency moves, signing Patrick Dangerfield from the Adelaide Crows. Now, Dangerfield is one player, and one player does not guarantee premierships, but his signing did mean that Geelong had maintained some star talent on their list to continue to build around. This move proved to be a masterstroke, as Dangerfield's first season at the Cats saw him claim the 2016 Brownlow medal with one of the best individual seasons by a player in recent times. Geelong's ability to maintain a competitive list through this period was quite impressive. Dangerfield added to an existing nucleus of guys like Mitch Duncan, Joel Selwood, Mark Blitzarves, Tom Hawkins and Harry Taylor. But their drafting around the back end of this period was equally impressive, particularly with who they got with late picks. Tom Stewart is the most extreme example, who was taken at pick 40 as a mature rager in 2016. But other speculative draft picks that proved to be successes include Blitzarves, Menegola, Myers, Atkins and Kolejasny. Geelong's ability to support their core guns through cheap list moves has been key to their prolonged success, and their ability to turn them into core contributors quickly is the reason why they've stayed relevant for so long despite a lack of high draft picks. Geelong also has a clear advantage to most teams when it comes to attracting mature talent. Now part of this advantage is inherent, they are well placed geographically to attract local talent back home to Geelong where they can enjoy a slightly more country lifestyle whilst not being far from Melbourne. But the other, larger part of their advantage is earned. Players want to come play for Geelong because of their proven track record of performance, as well as a strong culture. If you're a mature player wanting to move clubs and you want a chance at a flag, Geelong would have been an attractive destination to most. Over the years, they've used this advantage to attract a stack of talented, established players to join their list. We talked about Dangerfield, but there's also Gary Rowan, Jeremy Cameron, Isaac Smith and Zach Tui, and some less successful examples in Sean Higgins and Jack Stephen. Towards the back end of the decade, Gary Ablett would make an emotional return to the Cattery. Much was said of Geelong's brand new holy trinity of star midfielders in Selwood, Dangerfield and Ablett, although it's fair to say it took a little while for it to really get going. After losing three prelim finals in four years prior to 2020, the Cats would finally push past the barrier that year and make their first grand final in nine years against Richmond at the Gabba. It would end in heartbreak. Gary Ablett would retire, and there would again be renewed criticisms of Geelong's list strategy to hold on to their aging stars given their failure to achieve the ultimate success. 2021 would again end in a disappointing manner, with the Cats being unceremoniously thrashed in the prelim final against the rampaging Melbourne Demons. The external criticisms of Chris Scott and the club in general were intensifying, with the label too old, too slow thrown at the Cats to describe a list that was aging and needed a refresh soon. And this building criticism is what I think, as an outsider, could make the 2022 Premiership one of Geelong's most satisfying. It was a slow start to the season, losing four of their first nine games and looking away off the pace. But from there, the Cats exploded, just like the good old days, and they didn't lose a single game for the rest of the season. Their qualifying final win over the Pies was a thriller, but they were dominant in both the prelim and the grand finals, with a combined winning margin of over 150 points. It was the culmination of over a decade of building tension around the footy club. They decided to buck the typical AFL trend of having a swing for a flag and then retreating to the bottom of the ladder to stockpile draft talent. They've been audacious, single-minded, and the resilience paid off in a big way in 2022. It's hard to summarise the reasons for their dominant performance over a 15-year period in one single video, but I'll do my best to condense it into some primary factors. Firstly, they set themselves up to be a powerhouse football club from 2007 to 2011 through incredible drafting of talent prior to that. Equally important, however, has been their ability to instill a formidable culture that has bred success and attracted talent to want to come and play for them. Having some bona fide stars of the game want to play for them, such as Dangerfield and Jeremy Cameron, has been a massive boost, but almost just as important has been their ability to turn speculative talents into integral role players for their footy club. It's also worth mentioning their ability to keep their veteran players relatively healthy and playing well into their 30s. And finally, underpinning that has been a single-minded focus on sticking to their process and believing that success would follow. Had they listened to the critics too much throughout the last decade, the 2022 Premiership may well have never happened. Thanks for watching this video guys, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I would really appreciate it if you took the time to subscribe to the channel. Cheers, and I'll see you in the next video.